Hello and welcome back and that's right it's me and Eddie here at NAS Compares and I have taken a very unique opportunity here to talk about Computex 2023. Why is it unique? Well, well I got back from Computex like a day, day and a half ago now depending on your time zone of choice and I've not really spoken to Eddie much about it. Throughout the whole time that I was over in Taipei looking at Computex, the new releases and some of the brands that we cover doing their own separate thing, I sent loads of screenshots, I sent bits of info in the odd Skype WhatsApp message to Eddie but I didn't really really discuss it. So we thought about it and rather than me going through all of the details with him, you know, off the record, on the phone, whatever you want to call it, we decided to turn it into this Zoom. Eddie is going to represent you. And I'm going to tell Eddie everything I saw at Computex that was worth talking about. And he, representing you, is going to ask the questions you may have about it. In this video, we're going to talk about NAS, we're going to talk about DAS, we're going to talk about Wi-Fi, we're going to talk about a lot of things. But without further ado, I think we should crack straight on with the first bit. And that is Wi-Fi Bloody 7. I think I made like a YouTube short about this. And... It's the first time I've seen such a loud and proud presentation for Wi-Fi 7. Now, if I say Wi-Fi 7 to you, Eddie, what are you thinking immediately? Oh, better speeds. Are they going to cross two gigabit line, you know? Mm. All, all that bit. Security. Well, I would say straight away, Realtek kind of ruled the roost on it. Although there were little pocket presentation for some of the router kit on the Acer stand and stuff like that um, on the I believe the second floor of the Computex uh, events uh, where it was taking place Realtek had their own kind of not invite only but completely separate from the show showing off a lot of their innovations they were doing a lot of stuff um, with AI uh, some new embedded chips they're also looking at the uh, USB 3.2 Gen 2 uh, X2 SATA bridge that we talked about on the channel. But the main thing that really stood out was the Wi-Fi 7 coverage. They had multiple uh, controller boards and their entire roadmap on show for intended Wi-Fi 7 devices or 802.11BE uh, level hardware there. So Realtek have pretty much made some big, big promises for Wi-Fi 7 starting to roll out very gradually before the end of the year with their roadmap showing numerous different intended router configurations, maybe under obviously third-party brands, you know, Asus, maybe even D-Link as well. But I mean, straight away with Wi-Fi 7, have you got any questions, Eddie? Did they have actually working examples there or was it more like a working on patent I kind of knew this, like largely because whenever we talked about Wi-Fi 7 before and dating news of the week or other events, I think that is a very valid question because, frankly, we've heard a lot about Wi-Fi 7, but almost nowhere have we seen real tangible evidence. And I'm pleased to say they did. They had a whole, and hopefully it's on screen, they had a whole booth running constantly doing a ping test in there. We saw it crossing over the 2000 uh, mark there, megabit. So... It, they did have it on show. They did have the hardware. They had multiple examples of the hardware. Not only those root configurations that I talked about there, they even showed some of the M2 kind of uh, adapters that we're going to be seeing integrated either manually or fully into existing hardware architecture. So those tiny little adapters, be they directly soldered to the board or as a little M2 upgrade, they're all going to be rolling out, you know, comparatively soon. And it, they, you know, did show it working off quite well. They're on the six gigahertz band as well. So yeah, in terms of performance, we definitely saw them rolling out some stuff. But moving forward, um, we can talk about moving again, slightly away from the center of Computex itself, we could talk about Synology, a brand that we talk about on the brand, uh, on the channel a lot. They had their own standalone gig, like one stop down on the Metro. And it was there for the whole week. And it was just showing off the current status quo for a lot of their hardware and software. And I'm going to talk about two particular standout parts of their presentation. So get your question ready. Um, first thing I want to talk about is a so again i made a dedicated video about this but it's worth touching on again they are experimenting with in a quite proactive way integrating ai assistance into their collaboration suite more precisely they showed off into integrating ai supported services into synology mail plus and to a lesser but still significant degree into synology office there so straight away if i say to you what do you think the benefits are of integrating ai into some of their office collaboration sweet eddie what do you think so yeah i saw a little sneak peek mm. how they're integrating this ai in their email service which is really mm. great but i was just curious is this ai what they are using is it their own ai in synology it lives on synology premises somewhere on their servers or maybe locally on the NAS, 
or are they using third party AI like ChatGPT or other AI services? I mean, again, I did ask them and I'm not 100% certain they were chuffed at me asking, but ultimately it sounds like they were using a third party AI. Now, when I was utilizing it in Synology uh, Mail Plus, that wasn't a local IP. If you look at my videos, you'll see at the top left of the screen, it was a local IP that we were utilizing there. Consequently, um, it was whether this was a service that was running on a remote server that had access uh, to, again, using a third party AI or chat GDP, or they were utilizing a system that had an AI engine, but it was still a third party being integrated into. They did volunteer that it was not their own AI that they were utilizing for this. Also, because of the similarities in the uh, options and the way they were presented in terms of make it longer, summarize this, um, paraphrase, create that. It had bared such striking similarity to chat GD, GPT that it seems almost inevitable that if it wasn't that, it was that stylistic choice of AI being interacted in. Obviously, it was incredibly early doors. And although the options were presented quite well, I would still argue it's still very early days um, for AI on those platforms and how that gets interacted later on with regards to commands or searches um, or inquiries to within the system by the system admin will be interesting to see. But the other thing they had on display, uh, and it's something we've known about for a while because we've talked about it here on the channel, the storage media. They had pretty much the gamut of their available range of storage media. They had their enterprise drives, they had their enterprise SSDs, both in SATA and M2, and now finally rolling out the um, um, HAT3300 standard class series of hard drives. And before I go any further, Eddie, what are the standard class uh, Synology HAT3300 plus drives built on? Uh, I think it was on Seagate drives, isn't it? Absolutely. And one of the questions we had very early doors um, regarding these drives was, one, are they actually built on Seagate drives as the rumours and leaks that we'd heard indicated? And two, would Synology be forthcoming about it? And they were. On the front of every drive, on the bottom right, it says, made by Seagate. So they weren't even trying to hide it, which I thought was very, very good, because it would have been very easy for them to go, no, they're first party drives, get out of it. So I was pleased they didn't at least go down that road. So we knew the drives were coming, they got launched on the 31st, we did a video on article, blah, 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 blah. But Eddie, any questions? Yeah, about these drives, because they are called like home use drives. Can you actually use them in Excess series, NASes, something enterprisey? Well, yes and no. Um, one, you definitely can. You can definitely put them inside an enterprise level system. You will definitely be able to use them just like you would a Seagate drive or a Toshiba or a WD drive. However, they're not verified. They're not on the warranty support list. They're not going to be a drive that are going to appear on an XS level series device. So if you were looking at a DS362 XS Plus and you were slightly bulking at the cost of Synology's enterprise grade hard drives and you didn't like the idea that the compatibility was arguably a little bit more simplified and a little bit you know smaller and a bit meager by comparison and you were thinking oh cool Synology have got these other drives over here that which they say they're going to keep as um, comparable in price point to other drives in the market in the same sector no they've not included support of those drives on their enterprise grade systems and as I mentioned in my dedicated video I I understand that there will be people that are pissed about that because it's like for christ's sake they're your own drives how can they not be there but at the same time synology could have taken a very easy way out and just gone yeah you can use them whatever would get you to buy our nas but had they done that they would have drawn criticism that their whole strict support system was a fallacy so they clearly made that choice to not even support uh, officially or officially verify their non-enterprise drives in their enterprise level systems there on the whole i don't think it's going to please everyone but i think it's probably the most mature choice of all i just i hope synology don't go down that road of only limiting support of these drives to their own system i mean for you how do you feel about synology hard drives uh as long as they are not forcing people to go for their drives only i'm fine with that because there are few features like automated firmware updates without need to take every single drive out and do it manually. And uh, that's about it. Otherwise, I would uh, th there always need to be a choice between mm -hmm. third party and day drives. As long as that's an option, I'm happy with it.
Awesome. Okay, so what do you want to hear next? Do you want to hear about QNAP? Or Something about like SSDs. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to give you a choice, but hang on. I'm going to move my tabs around. Blah, 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 blah. SSDs. Man alive, there are a lot of Gen 5 SSDs at this show. Again, I kind of knew there would be because Gen 5 as an SSD tier has been somewhat delayed, you know, <coughs> pandemic um, and other factors uh, such as hardware resources, uh, US China trade war, uh, uh, droughts. Um, there's been so many reasons why Gen 5 has been lagging behind. Probably one of the other reasons, of course, is the initial hardware architecture these drives are going to be going into isn't really able to eke the most out of them at this time. But I saw them all. Well, A Data had two examples there. One of them was water cooled. One of them was a fairly well standard class uh, drive. We saw different SSD controllers. Um, Viper rolled out their own SSD there at the show. Team Group had one of the most impressive arrangements of heat sinks I've seen at the show in a very, very long time. There were so many Gen 5 SSDs. I mean, are you are you on the verge of buying a Gen 5 SSD for your new rig, Ed? Oh, definitely, definitely on, on, on the verge. That's a new technology, isn't it? Uh, DDR5 is now out as well. D you know, five, oh, giant course. Gen 5 motherboard, everything. So I think we are ready for Gen 5. I think another thing that really stood out when we talk about the evolution of Gen 5, by the way, and again, I'm not, I'm pretty sure I put this in a video. I might be wrong. If I haven't, I apologize. Um, when Gen 4 first came about, there was this whole thing of the first early generation of, uh, so when Gen 4 drives came out, the first generation of Gen 4 drives, they reached about five, five and a half thousand megabytes per second, and the world rejoiced. And then about a year, year and a bit later, they made an even better, more efficient version of that, and they were able to hit 7,000 megs per second. And the world rejoiced. So after the world rejoiced a couple of times, um, the muscles within the Gen 4 sector started to stretch and you saw different versions. So you started seeing smaller 2230 and 2240 Gen 4 SSDs and you started seeing DRAMless uh, Gen 4 SSDs. That is SSDs that don't have onboard memory that rely on utilising the host's memory, uh, known as HMB, host memory buffer. We didn't see DRAMless Gen 4 drives for quite a long time. DRAMless SSDs, although they don't give you quite performance, of a Gen uh, of a Gen 4 drive that has memory on board, uh, DRAMless Gen 4 SSDs are a little bit more affordable due to the fewer components that are required on there, and because of that lower threshold, that some of them actually have quite good durability as well. Now, the reason I bring all this up is, despite the fact that I can barely find a Gen 5 drive to buy right now. Uh, Viper were rolling out, or at least showing off, their prototype for the DRAMless Gen 5 SSD. And this was utilising uh, a Fizon's new 31T controller. See, Fizon, Gen 5, again, has barely rolled out, and there's even a DRAMless Gen 5 controller. And there's just this feeling with Gen 5 SSDs at the moment that they're trying to compress a year to a year and a half of innovation into about seven minutes right now. And there are so many i mean i remember when gen 4 first rolled around there was barely two controllers there was the fizon controller and there was a bunch of stuff that might happen over here whereas at the moment we have three active controllers floating around in the market maybe even four as well with the silicon motion actually outperforming the uh, the fizon e26 controller out there at the market but before we go to the next subject any questions yeah were there actual tests uh, what was your favorite SSD? Boom. So straight away, um, when it comes to tests, I would say the team group, uh, they were one of the few there that actually had live testing. They had a constant running crystal disk test going over and over again. And again, you know, you're right to point out, barely any stands actually had live drive testing. Um, even like Gigabyte, who were one of the earliest brands to have a drive out there early doors with their 10,000 series, which instantly became slightly obsolete as everyone else made the most of the delay to produce even better SSDs with improved uh, layer now, hence why a gigabyte have now had to roll out the 1200. But of all the SSDs that were on show, I would say my favorite one is probably that A-Data one, the uh, Project Neon Storm. Because not only is it, you know, it's water cooled and it looks really high concept, like those cars. I don't, I'm not a car guy, but when you see those concept cars that come out that look like, you know, they gave a five year old a crown and went draw a fast car, that's how the Project Neon Storm SSD looked. Water cooled fans on either end. 
but it's the sort of product that gets people interested. And that's why for me, that was probably the standout drive amongst all of the ones that I saw, because you could tell Adata were trying to be as disruptive as possible. And indeed, that was another one that wasn't built on Faisal. That was another one using the Silicon Motion Gen 5 SSD controller. Um, but moving forward, let's talk QNAP. Because of all the brands that we talk about here on NAS Compares, very few made as much noise during Computex as QNAP, and they weren't even at the start in Computex. Prior to Computex starting, the day before, they had their own partner event. And again, partner event, I've never quite understood what that means. If it's like marketing partners, is it sales partners, whatever. Um, and from there, the two big, big, big standouts, and there were some other bits, but definitely the big standouts for me. Uh, what do you want to hear, Ed? Do you want to hear about Thunderbolt? I want to hear about Thunderbolt. Is it mm. finally coming out, this TS4644? <laughs> or is it dead in the... Um, you know? Yeah, well, you're right to scoff. Yes, we talked earlier in the week about, uh, earlier last week, QNAP revealed two new Thunderbolt 4 solutions, the TVS H um, X744 series and the rather unique, but I would still say pretty bleeding edge, um, uh, TBS H574TX, I'm a hoot at parties. Now, the first one there is utilizing the existing 7.4 series. So it's got uh, an Intel uh, 12th Gen Core, and that's an i7 or an i9 version there. And it arrives with uh, Thunderbolt 4 connectivity, no 10 GPE, weirdly. Um, but at least it still has it. And they say they're going to be releasing that in, uh, in Q3, which is, again, if you're going to go Q3, that's July till September. My money's on September, October. But the uh, 574TX, uh, this 5-bay that's utilizing um, E1S SSD architecture, so that is ultimately a hot swappable and more, energy, uh, more cooling efficient and capacity ready M2 NVMe. You can even just install normal M2 NVMe's into these hot swappable bays of this thing. And this thing arrived with slightly lower end Intel Core processors, but given the scale of the device, it makes a bit more sense. Um, but on top of that, it also arrives not only with Thunderbolt 4, but 10 GBE on board as well. This thing was the NADS. It was lovely. And it was that apparently is going to arrive in September, October as well. However, you're right to ask, are these things even going to arrive? And did we hear about the 464T4? Well, one, I think they will arrive because we actually physically saw the device um, and utilization. But the 464T4, I asked several people there. And of the five people I asked, two of them said it's not going to happen. Two of them said in progress. And one of them refused to answer my question. So, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to that. I'm hoping to get something clarified before the end of the week so we can actually make a video either condemning or promising that a device is actually going to happen. But QNAP as well during the show did show off something else, and that was My Cloud QNAP 1, the QNAP Cloud platform. Sound familiar? Um, well, yeah, it sounds like Synology C2. Yeah, it's a perfectly valid point to make. Um, I think everyone thought it as well. Um, Synology did numerous uh, miniature presentations, some of which we're going to sort of write up about, uh, some of which we'll do a big overview for. Uh, a lot of it to do with their VM platform now uh, being a little bit uh, improved upon, as well as uh, factoring in things like high availability improvements within BoxSafe, improvements within their AR algorithm within surveillance. But, you know, truth be told, the one that stood out the most is QNAP's own cloud there. This is, uh, they're going to be, uh, I would argue, emulating uh, the same thing that we've seen from Synology C2. Um, it's going to have 20 different uh, locations worldwide uh, for their cloud platform for you to synchronize and back up your data to off-site. Um, they're highlighting that the price point, the entry point, I believe was $4.99 or $5.99. Um, and it was a 16 gig trial you're not getting space included every user there it is still um, something you're going to have to pay for as an additional purchase there um, but they also rolled out a few other um, improvements one of which was hybrid um, backup uh, center which was I would argue their alternative to Synology's active backup suite although it didn't have localized image level backup it seemed to have everything else rolled in but it was just interesting to see them embracing this cloud storage and embracing 
their alternative to active backup. I think we can arguably, you know, we're being very charitable. They are clearly seeing what Synology are doing and trying to do their own version of it. But, I mean, I'm glad they got it. Um, have you got any questions about the cloud? Yeah, I'm curious about those servers. Are they actually going to be queuing up on servers? Are they going to use Amazon servers or any other brand servers? Um, I asked three separate people about that, and no one gave me a clear answer. Um, so um, either they are using third-party servers or building up large areas of their own, but given that no one would give me a straightforward answer, and we're talking about the scale of storage, every possibility they are utilizing pre-existing cloud data center space. Um, now, that wouldn't be unheard of, and I think it would be fair to say that they wouldn't be the only people doing that when brands have their own cloud storage, that it's actually reappropriated storage from other cloud providers. But given that I don't have a straightforward answer to that or a complete confirmed answer to that, I'm ever so slightly reluctant yeah. to commit um, to that. But also, are they going to use the same um, technology like C2 does? Because they, uh, there is no actual physical data on C2 cloud. Before any data is being sent to C2, it's, it's encrypted. So there's just gibberish sent to the server. Is, is this something similar what QNIP is going to do? Again, I'm going to be going through a lot of my original notes. Uh, and hopefully like this week, I'll do a dedicated video on QNAP Cloud One. But I want to make sure that my questions get answered by QNAP first. So I'm putting together a whole ranging selection of questions there to put to them. And then I'll make the video. They did cover a lot of things in their presentation. It was a whole big slideshow that covered a lot of details about how it will be integrated uh, what steps are, is it going to be block level storage, is it going to be individual uh, sizes, disaster recovery, things like that. But until I have answers to those questions, and if they don't answer them, I'll still make the video and say that they weren't answered. But until then, I'm reluctant to kind of, because I remember stuff that was said during the presentation, but for all I know, I'm going to utterly butcher it. So I would hate to say something that turns out to be incorrect a week from now. So I'm going to slightly hold off from answering questions on that one. Um, but carrying on on the subject of NAS, Let's talk about the Plucky Guys Asus store. I mean, again, I use Plucky. That's so condescending. They're not underdogs or anything. But they put out so much hardware at this event. Um, they Gen 2'd the bulk of their range. It was insane. The number of things, everything, the Drive Store Gen 2, the Nimbus Store Gen 2. There was Gen 2 everywhere you looked. And fr first, and then right there at the front, numerous of their flash door series they were pushing flash door hard and it got a lot of recognition fair play to them there but it, their nimbus store gen 2 was the thing probably that stood out for me because i've obviously talked about the flash door and i'm working on a review there but the nimbus store gen 2 i mean i don't think i've been overly secretive about it nimbus store when it first came out in 2019 was one of my favorite NASs of that year it was the first desktop 2.5 gigabit ethernet NAS it was the first NAS that was utilizing the J4000 processor there it was one of the NASs that were doing a lot of the firsts before all the other NAS brands kind of did that in their own way afterwards so with the Nimbus Store Gen 2 it is utilizing the N5105 processor it's got four M2 slots and either two or four hard drive slots. It's a lot of storage being pan, uh, packed in there. And it's also got USB 10 gig there on board, HDMI 2.0B. Uh, it's just, in terms of hardware, it's tremendously great value. And although the Nimbus store, uh, sorry, um, the Drive Store series has taken advantage of that real tech that we've seen Solange and QNAP start to utilize the RTD1619B, the, uh, the Nimbus Store series for me did stand out. Any questions? Yeah, did you? Uh, I heard there were some issues in America no. about calling those uh, models Nimbus Store. Did is there any ongoing case or something? Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, once uh, this was pointed out in the previous in the comments of the previous video, um, Asus or it might be in the article. Um, th the name Nimbus Store doesn't exist in the U.S. Apparently, um, by Asus Store, and that's because either it's owned by another organization there or. The, the, the term Nimbus Store, they just couldn't get the, the secure pattern on that. So it's traded there over there on IS6202T, you know, the usual naming convention there. So they weren't able to confirm whether this new system will have the Nimbus Store name. It doesn't look like it will. So if you are in the US watching this in the future, don't bother looking out for the Nimbus Store name. You're not going to find it. Um, but really, I, I don't think it matters too much. I mean, again, if they can't get the name, they can't get the name. But yeah, if you're in the US, I wouldn't look out for the name Nimbus Store. It's the AS6, um, 
uh, 4.02T and the AS 6.404T. Again, absolute hoot at parties there. But that's really it. There was lots of other smaller things throughout the whole of Computex. So, uh, not uh, Seagate and uh, QNAP are working on some expansions together. And QNAP have got some intended large-scale JBOD SAS expansions coming out, pre-populated with Seagate Exos drives. And they were showing off some enormous enclosures alongside a bunch of new, insane DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5 rack mounts QNAP were as well. So, I mean, again, when it comes to rack mount users, QNAP are really going to be pushing hard uh, this year, both in that conjunction with, QNAP, uh, uh, with Seagate, uh, with those uh, existing Exos pre-populated arrays, but also these new AMD Ryzen systems that are going to be using DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5. The price of them is going to be astrosodding-nomical, um, but still, nonetheless, they are going to be rolling out there. Ultimately, Computex, although there was lots of other things outside of our sphere of things, everything from graphics cards to just general IoT bits, when it comes to NAS and uh, PCIe storage, and of course, we mentioned about at the beginning with routers and Wi-Fi 7, it looks like all of this is going to be really kicking off by September, October of this year. How much have we talked about is actually going to arrive? I don't know. But for you, Eddie, what's the standout for you of everything I've discussed? Oh, definitely queued up new releases regarding Thunderbolt series. That's that's pretty outstanding. Mm. It's something I, that I'd actually like to see closer look at, you know. I'm hoping they roll out a USB 4 support on those bad boys as well, because they did state USB 4 support in different areas that I saw it, but I didn't know if that would be where the client and the host reverse. But anyway, this has been all the data storage stuff that we saw at Computex. Eddie, I hope I've kept you informed, and you watching, I hope I've kept you informed as well. This is pretty much it for our Computex coverage. I'm going to be doing some dedicated stuff, as mentioned, on QNAP's own partner event. There's a few other little Synology bits from the show that I'm going to discuss. But have I missed anything, something you saw on any other platform out there? Do no. let me Are know. you going to go next year again? Um, I think I will. I think I will. But more on that, uh, hopefully, later this year, if things get confirmed, I hope. But apart from that, um, again, thanks for joining, Eddie. Uh, thanks for everyone watching. Thanks, everyone. Um, have yourselves a fantastic week. There'll be links in the description to all the other videos and articles and everything we've covered. I've spent most of the weekend writing up a bunch of stuff, and I'm still nowhere near finished, so do check that out. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time.